Well, we're here today at ISNTD D3. I'm joined by Dr. Mark Payne from the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. So welcome and thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, you spoke earlier today um, on this Diagnostics Day and um, your field is obviously in vectors and insecticide resistance and I just was wondering whether you could explain to us how you fit into this day. So, yeah, I mean basically I work all Certainly, the, the group I work with, we work on the sort of insect side of things, and they transmit obviously lots of nasty diseases. A lot of them are uh, neglected tropical diseases like visceral leishmaniasis and Zika, as we've heard recently. Uh, and I think really a, a focus of a lot of our research is is trying to sort of uh, understand how insecticides, how if you like, insects uh, respond to insecticides because to control uh, insects, um, insecticides really is the sort of first point of defense. Uh, and inevitably, a bit like antibiotics, if you use them a lot and if you don't use them well, then resistance comes in fairly rapidly. So try to understand that and try to develop, if you like, diagnostics that would help us to track resistance and stop it before it becomes a problem is something that we're about. Fantastic. Yeah, uh, certainly a big challenge ahead with um, the time kind of ticking rapidly. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you kind of partner or link or fit in the ecosystem with all of the diagnostics companies out there? What sort of um, relationship are you looking for? I think, um, I think diagnostics companies tend to work and understand sort of diagnostics around the sort of clinical arena. And so um, when we're trying to produce diagnostics for resistance, the market is, is, is a little different. And what I didn't mention before as well, we're not just uh, interested in the, in, the, in the insect side of things. As I said, if you don't use insecticides at the correct doses, if you underdose, for example, that's a big driver for resistance. And what we really need to do is to use the insecticides properly. So on the other hand, we also need diagnostics for the insecticides themselves. So marrying <coughs> both the insect and the insecticides as well um, will allow us, if we can get it right, to really tightly manage how insecticides are used and how we can really prevent or certainly slow down the development of resistance. Now the types of diagnostics that are out there are mainly laboratory based. So if you take insecticide resistance, there's a lot of PCR type methods which can track certain elements of resistance. But very few of these are actually in commercial development, they're very much lab based. Um, and resistance is very, very complex, so there are many types of resistance. So you might have uh, a diagnostic for a target site with a, a single mutation in the target of the insecticide can stop it working. So you can easily produce a diagnostic for that. But there is resistance that happens when the insecticide itself is metabolized uh, and there are many, many enzymes, up to 100, that can potentially metabolize insecticides. So trying to identify which one of those is all which few of those is important, is very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. And the types of diagnostic you would need for that may be very different to the diagnostic you need for target site. So it's a very complicated area, and trying to bring about a practical tool that could be used, if you like, in the field, is something we are desperate to do, but the model to do it is not terribly well developed. So what we would like, I guess at this stage, would be to engage with companies to look at the problem and see what we can do together to try and identify the problems, the issues, and try and work together to develop, if you like, the simplest possible tools, the most practical tools, that might be able to uh, help identify the resistance. That would be fantastic. And um, <clears throat> how do you foresee the the reaction of such companies and... I think it's difficult actually. I think part of my hesitation is um, I think 
what we're looking at is when you look at developing uh, insecticide resistance tools or tools to, to measure the insecticides themselves, because they're not so readily available, they're not sort of ingrained in our psyche, if you like, um, it's very difficult sometimes to get companies to take on, if you like, a new sort of area. Uh, and so, because it takes a lot of investment by a company, especially small companies, um, and they prioritize. So trying to get a, a priority aspect to uh, so identifying, say, developing a resistance uh, um, a diagnostic or a diagnostic for insecticides does require a lot on the company part to say, right, we're going to do this, we're going to invest the time and energy, and there's no guarantees that we have the market at the end of it, because not everybody actually wants to have diagnostic for insecticides because it's another level of, if you like, administration and what they do. So it's really very difficult. I don't think it's an easy answer. I think that there needs to be, this has to be done in a partnership where both the companies have, if you like, in mind the idea that they're doing something that is not just for a profit um, gain, but actually has, has a human society aspect where if we don't develop these these, uh, these uh, new tools, we are, if you like, paralleling the situation we see now with antibiotics, where resistance is coming in and we have a perfect storm where we could end up with resistance to antibiotics and resistance to insecticides, and that would be a catastrophic mm -hmm. situation. And really, what we have to do is to develop the tools that will allow us to really, really understand what the resistance is, where it's coming from, how we can stop it in its tracks, so that we can continue to use the insecticides or the antibiotics that we've already developed and make sure that they last for decades rather than a couple of years. So, so I think there's, there's a sort of philosophical aspect of this as well as identify both the the, the, if you like, the profitable the profit of making these tools versus also the fact that they are important from a humanitarian point of view and how we can do that, I think, is a model that has yet to be developed. To be so changing the kind of frame of mind and um, people's viewpoint and awareness of the growth of insecticide resistance was really one of the conclusions of your talk. And I was wondering, um, as a field of vector professionals, is there more that we could do to spread the word outside of kind of the immediate stakeholders and researchers and industry? Yes, I think we can, and, and I think, and I alluded to it in the talk, you know, a couple of days ago, Margaret, you know, Chang from WHO, you know, mentioned the fact that you know the. the we're sort of reaping the whirlwind for, for failing to, to really instigate good vector control in the 70s. Um, and I think, and that's popped up on the BBC News, and, and I think it's that sort of public awareness of the fact that insecticides, although they don't get a good press, and at the end of the day, we'd rather not use insecticides, but the bottom line is they are the best way of really getting to a disease that's transmitted by insects very quickly. So we do need to have a certain public awareness that um, these are very important. Um, we need to use them wisely, we need to use them well, we need to make sure they work, but we have to be able to be working with people who understand their importance. And I think getting a wider awareness of that is very important. It helps in terms of switching on funding bodies to the idea that actually vector control is vitally important. Um, and we are in a situation where we really, really do need to do something about it. 
and that actually the technology is out there, it is available. It's about putting it together in a targeted way with, if you like, the, the full awareness of everybody out there that, you know, this, let's do this. Very much like what's happening with antibiotics as well. I mean, everybody now I think, <coughs> understands the fact that you cannot just use antibiotics for everything. They don't work for viruses. They're not designed for that. So if you have a cold, an antibiotic is no good. Don't use it. Uh, and if people understand that, then you know, everybody is a little bit more aware of, of, of what they're doing and, and are not, if you like, you know, are, are more aware of, of the situation. That's fantastic, and that's a message that's you know echoed very clearly in our Bytes network, which um, looks at vectors, mm -hmm. and hopefully the message will be loud and clear today for the um, drug and pharma and diagnostic colleagues that are here today and the wider network at large. So yeah, a massive thank you for thank your participation and your presentation. Well, and th uh, thank you very much, and, and I should just say, I think from, from our, my perspective as a vector biologist, it's, it is really interesting to see the sorts of talks and, and the work that's going on in the diagnostic area because I think we really do need to be working much more closely together. We can certainly, uh, uh, certainly learn from one another mm. on this. And with the speed of innovation in that field as well, it's a good time to embrace um, different even models of collaboration and Absolutely. integration. Absolutely. So we look forward to hearing um, positive updates uh, soon. <coughs> from Let's hope so. <laughs> so yeah, and thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Okay.